Hey, good morning, guys. It's Drew here. Today, I want to talk uh, economics. Uh, occasionally, I get into economics, and as you guys know, it's one of my favorite uh, topics. And um, today, I want to get into why socialism would not work for the United States. And before I get into this, let me address the most common line that I hear from liberals. And that is the, that is the, con the general consensus of economists do not agree with you. I want to say that again. This is a statement that most liberals use in order to refute, you know, typical mixed market capitalism that we've had that has made our nation a great nation. They typically say most economists do not agree with you. Well, my first question is this, like if you've studied economics um, or if you haven't, who are most economists? Are you just using a percentage that the government has uh, spit out to you? Are you using a percentage that uh, you know, the 1% has spit out to you, the top, top, top 1%? Where are you getting that most economist percentage from? That's a good question. But basic economics tells you that there are two kinds of economists, basic kinds. And we're not gonna get into Austrian or Keynesian yet or supply side because those are just methods, but economists at their core, there are two types. They're interventionists and they're not interventionists. There are people who think that you should let the magical hand of the free market guide the decisions of people who are involved in the free market or the free market economy. And then there are people who think that there needs to be um, consistent and constant human intervention so as to avoid you know, losses and, and whatnot, okay? Uh, or, or to avoid immediate pain and, and, and whatnot. Now, let's just address that point too as well. Um, as far as the economy goes, in a free market system, right, where you have resources and you have, you know, um, consumers, you have demand, you have supply. In a free market system, if you let it guide itself, uh, the equation will always eventually balance itself out because consumers are free to make decisions and so are suppliers. Now, most people understand inherently that math and, 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 and natural occurrences of things can be a little bit harsh. I mean, the free market balancing itself out could mean that some people will go hungry. It could mean that some people will, will starve or some people Will, will be very big losers in, in, in the system. But the equation will balance itself out. And it also ensures for longest term um, sustainability and balancing. Now, with uh, the question is, with in, an interventionist logic, with an, an economic interventionist logic, are those things avoided more? Are they caused more? Or are they, do they occur just about the same rate? And um, I would like to say that I think initially they're avoided more, but I think the more they're initially avoided, the more they're pushed into the future. Somebody eventually is gonna have to pay the piper. You see what I'm saying? The thing about, I think that you guys need to understand, whether you're a liberal or whether you're a conservative, we learn in finance and we learn in economics. As you guys know my background, I have a very strong history of economics. I took advanced economics in high school, and then after high school, I went as far as to get a Series 7 and Series 63. I manage money for the top 1%. I'm a consumer goods chief operating officer, so I'm very used to managing, executing, strategizing, and seeing things from a strategic standpoint. All right, so let's get back to it, okay? Whether you think that the free market works or doesn't work, or whether you think that you're an interventionist or not, the one key point is that fundamentals always come full circle. Always. Always. Fundamentals, I'll use a, a very, very careful example. Let's take Bernie Madoff, for example, because he's a great example, because he himself was a $50 billion economy, correct? Right? He was walking around with $50 billion in his Ponzi scheme right? 
And all it took was a prick in the bubble. All it took was the exposure of the bubble for the entire thing to come tumbling down. But before that, losses and pain were delayed. But the delaying of those losses in Bernie Sanders' mini economy, I mean, not Bernie Sanders, sorry, Bernie Madoff's, Bernie Madoff's mini Ponzi scheme economy, the result of the delay was that in the short term, there was no pain. Everybody was happy and smiling in the bubble. Everybody was going on their way up. Everybody was making ridiculous percentage returns and uh, percentage gains. But then the end result of that central planning, the end result of that Ponzi scheme on a micro level, on Bar Bernie Sanders level, I mean, why do I keep saying Bernie Sanders? Bernie Madoff's level. The end result was more pain because he affected more people because the scheme was allowed to go on longer. The same exact concept applies to the US economy, okay? You cannot, you cannot, you cannot redistribute yourself to wealth. It doesn't work, okay? Now people cite Norway, they cite um, Finland, they cite, um, where else do they cite? They cite, um, they cite all these places that aren't truly socialist. I mean, you're citing places that have small populations relative to their GDP production. You have to look at debt to GDP ratio, debt to GDP ratio. You have to look at producers to takers level. And I don't mean to say that, you know, to, to take a stab at your emotions, but there are makers and there are takers in this world, okay? And when you're looking at the economy on a macroeconomic scale, you gotta look at these things, okay? You gotta look at who's producing it relative to the population. How many people are producing relative to the population? Because these are the things that determine what economic system would work best for a setting. Because there are some places, I'm not an absolutist, I, I, I'm a pragmatist. There are some places where there's like maybe one natural resource and I guess redistribution is all they can kind of hope to, to, to work with. There are some places where, you know, a, a production economy or uh, um, a mixed market capitalist economy that allows, you know, uh, uh, laissez faire, you know, non government intervention in private business affairs. There are some countries where that won't work because if those countries grow, they become competitors to other countries that seek to destabilize them in the global competitive markets. So when you're talking about global economics, it's a little bit different. And you can't always. Um, it's not always a one size fits all policy, but let's get into it. But America, the system for America of production, it works. It works because we have so many people here and those people need to be fed. Those people need to consume. And the only way that those people can consume is if there's production. There has to be production. There has to be, in fact, a greater ratio of production than there is consumption. And that tide is changing. I mean, when you see people jumping onto food stamps and the, the food, the people, the rate of people on food stamps grows, you know, when you see people, more, more uh, people sitting in the cart than people pushing it, then you know you have a problem. Now I know some, I know some politicians support socialism when they know it can't work for this economy because it guarantees one thing. It guarantees that your politicians will definitely have more power because it re restricts your flow of economic mobility. That's why it guarantees that you will have more power concentrated in the hands of the aristocracy. It guarantees that. And the politicians know this. I'm not sure all of them know this. I'm not sure Bernie Sanders know this, but I know, I know for a fact there are some politicians that do know this. And they're using it in order to restrict the flow of capitalism or the flow of um, empowerment that capitalism and mixed market capitalism, free market capitalism gives individuals. It's, we're, we're, we're basically trying to downsize. For, for what reason, I don't know. 
I did read somewhere in some text that the New World Order, the plan is to get, take from the have countries and give to the have not countries. So, I mean, that does kind of fit right, uh, right into their plans. It does kind of fit into Agenda 21. I mean, it, it does fit into all these things. But the whole point is that, you know, when you look at uh, what's going to provide the best quality of life for individuals, another metric that's good, another economic metric that's great to look at is the GDP per capita. Where the GDP per capita is higher, that's typically where you would find the greatest prosperity per citizen. Now, uh, of course, you know, those like, let's go back to those socialist countries, Norway and um, all those places. Like I said, those places aren't thriving just because they redistribute. They're not thriving because they redistribute. They're thriving because their production relative to their population has a great balance. In the United States, that's not the case. If you start uh, redistributing, you know, this is a place where people are competitive. This is a place where people, it's a melting pot. People are of different cultures. People, uh, you know, people have their own, sometimes they have their own cliques, their own groups. If you start doing that, it's not long before you create resentment. Um, people will start closing up shops. That's what I predict. And I think that in the long run, it will have a negative effect on our economy. Now, I know it's very convenient for a lot of people who are in the have not category in America to believe that redistributing, you know, services and things to them is all of a sudden going to increase the quality of their life. But if that were the case, you know, the programs that the government should, has in place should be taking people off of them. It shouldn't be keeping people onto them. You know, I've seen posts on the internet where people say, you know, I wonder who's going to inherit my, I, I've seen posts on the internet from poor people who say, I wonder who's going to inherit my, 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 uh, my EBT. I wonder who's going to inherit my section eight you know what i mean i've seen people say that on the internet it's like the problem is only when it becomes a lifestyle and i feel like the policies that the government has put in has made it a lifestyle unless you can prove that a high percentage of people that go on to government programs come off it and become successful individuals you cannot say that social services in the united states have produced successful outcomes and, and that's just what it is you know, I'm not biased against the poor. Um, I, I've actually looked into, I just believe, I, I inherently believe and I've seen that it's just so much better to empower people. Let people keep more of their money. Let people become creative. It furthers our country as a whole. You know, when people are like, okay, I'm going to go out and make this. I'm going to go out and produce this. I'm going to go out and earn this because nobody's going to give it to me. It really furthers our country as a whole. It makes us more creative. It makes us more competitive. And it makes us grow. But there are some politicians that don't want us to grow. And I've explained why in our video before. You know, America is sometimes seen as a global investment that has reached peak value. There's many people in the super, super billionaire class that want to see it come down so they can make money on the downside and then make money back again on the upside. Or not even make money, but just acquire more power, acquire more resources for themselves and their circle. You know, so they fund anti-American uh, policies that would weaken the country, very clearly weaken the country. But you or I that are clearly invested in this economy, we should be in interested in policies that would strengthen the economy, strengthen the country. That's what we should be interested in. And that's it. I hope you've enjoyed my rant on the economy today. And it's a beautiful day outside. And um, those of you going to get it, going to work, keep going, keep striving for the best and have a wonderful day.